What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your daily session. Huddle the Bitcoin. Before we dive in, just a quick reminder, please do check out my website, btcsessions.ca. This is where you can reach out to me directly and book your own BTC session. All you need to do is scroll down to the bottom of the page and there is a contact form you can fill out to reach out to me and you can start learning about Bitcoin, wallets, property security, whatever you like. Beyond that, if you want some swag, you can head over to my Teespring link, which again will also be down below in the show notes, and you can pick up some stuff at the store there. Um, of course, always hit like and subscribe and turn on that bell notification uh, so that you know when new videos are coming out. But let's dive into the news. Some news about Tether today. Those of you unfamiliar, Tether is a US dollar backed stable coin that is an ERC20 token, which means that it's based on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, at least initially, I think there's Omni. I don't, I'm not quite sure what Omni is, but anyways, it's got multiple implementations. Anyways, um, so Tether has always said that they were backed one to one by US dollars. So for every tether that exists, there is a US dollar somewhere in an account in reserves, wherever. To quote their website uh, from before, anyways, uh, they said, every tether is always backed one to one by traditional currency held in our reserves. So one USDT is always equivalent to one USD. But they quietly updated their terms of service on their website to read this instead. Every tether is always 100% backed by our reserves, which include traditional currency and cash equivalents, and from time to time may include other assets and receivables from loans made by tether to third parties, which may include affiliated entities, collectively reserves. So what does that mean? Well, that means that rather than every tether existing being tied to an existing US dollar that's sitting in a bank account or wherever, it means that the assets that, that tether is backed up by can include cash in accounts or it can include loans that tether has given out to other people and expect to be paid back for. So much like a bank uh, would give somebody a loan and then list that on their books as an asset because they own the loan and they expect to receive back money for it. Um, that appears to be what Tether is doing. So they've reinvented banking, uh, fractional reserve banking, maybe, I don't know. Um, but that means that, yes, they have an asset, a loan that is backing Tether, but that asset is is dependent on that loan being honored. If the person defaults on the loan, could they possibly no longer be backed one to one? If enough of that happened, perhaps. Could they possibly become insolvent? Maybe, I don't know. It depends what kind of loans and how risky they they're getting with it. But um, I mean, yeah, it's it's no longer one to one US dollars. It's now we're backing it by our assets, which could vary. Um, so some facts about Tether. There's about one point nine billion dollars worth of Tether in circulation currently. Uh, last December, Bloomberg News reported that uh, they were provided with bank statements um, to basically prove that Tether held enough reserves to back their 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 tokens one to one, and the December before in 2017, uh, Tether and its sister firm Bitfinex were subpoenaed by the CFTC. Though the reasoning behind that subpoena was never really clarified, so that just kind of hangs in the air there. Um, now. Plenty of people, including a, a famous Twitter account that has now been doxxed and disappeared, uh, uh, accused Tether and Bitfinex of essentially printing money, not having one-to-one -one backing, and using that printed money to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. But 
none of that was ever officially substantiated. So interesting. Uh, I would just, I'm not a big fan of stable coins because you have a digital asset that is pegged to a real world asset and you have taken what's meant to be trustless with Bitcoin. If you have it, you have it because the asset is digital. You can just check the blockchain. Uh, with something like this, you check the blockchain, you see you have the token, but the token is pegged to something real world. So you have to trust somebody to do that audit to make sure that the real world asset is real there is really there. So in that point, what's the point of the blockchain? Because if you feed bad data into it, then it's useless. Um, so for me, I don't know. I don't know. These t stable coins tend to, to worry me. Uh, but hey, Play, play, play at your own risk, I suppose. Uh, let's move on here. This is a funny, interesting slash painful story out of Singapore. So there's a Singapore crypto exchange called Coin, and I think I'm saying that right. It's spelled Q U O I N E. Um, and in early 2017, they experienced a glitch on their trading platform. What was the glitch? Well, it was. A doozy, uh, for a brief moment in time, you could trade one Ethereum and in exchange get 10 Bitcoin. <laughs> now, the actual exchange rate of Ethereum at that point, you would trade one Ethereum and get 3.6% of a Bitcoin. So, quite the markup. Um, now, a liquidity provider uh, by the name of B2C2 figured that out and executed a number of trades uh, mounting in 309 Ether being exchanged for 3,092 Bitcoin. And if you're trying to do the math in your head there, that's taking $14,000 and turning it into about 3.9 million at the time. Um, now, of course, the exchange caught this and they reversed the trades. But rather than just going, eh, well, I tried, uh, B2C2 actually took them to court and sued them for this. Um, and the basis of the suit was in their terms of agree uh, their agreement, user agreement, let's see, right here, uh, they, the, they said that B2C2 um, argued that the exchange acted fraudulently because their agreement states that the order is irreversible once completed. And the court ruled in favor of the liquidity provider and said that, you're right, that's, that's fraudulent behavior. They, they stated one thing in their terms and they did another and they reversed it regardless of whether or not there was a bug, which is crazy. Wow. Um, so this kind of sets a precedent of you better look over your terms of service if you are uh, an online exchange, especially in Singapore, if this is how they're going to be treating it. Um, now, the court did say that they're not going to make them pay back the entire 3,000 plus Bitcoin that were owed at the time. They're taking the dollar value of the Bitcoin that the person would have gotten at the time and converting that to what it would buy worth of Bitcoin right now. So uh, B2C2 still stands to get about 1,000 Bitcoin out of this deal, all coming from 309 Ether. So that's still a pretty good deal. Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> I don't even really know what to say to this one, but I guess good, good for B2C2 uh, and not great for, for coin. Uh, wow. I wanted to finish on one other, uh, just a post I found on Reddit and I thought it was quite well done. Um, and this was posted by... Uh, the username is terrible, 45SBVAD. Anyways, the title of the post is Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Debt. Now, what debt is this person referring to? They're referring to the U.S. national debt, which is sitting at around $22.1 trillion. Uh, this is the U.S. debt clock .org website, and it gives all kinds of crazy statistics 
So per citizen in the U.S., uh, everybody, regardless of, of anything, owes essentially $67,000. Um, the debt per taxpayer, just the taxpaying citizens, essentially owe about $180,000 each. Um, and it shows live tickers of federal spending and deficit spending and all these other uh, interesting metrics there that are eye-opening and scary. But what is said in this post on Reddit here? Um, so this individual goes into a lot of stuff centering around, again, the, the national debt and the way that the world economy is moving, but in relation to Bitcoin. And so this person starts out by saying that um, the crash is not coming as soon as you think. Uh, and they're referring to the fact that most people or a lot of people in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin tend to refer to the fact that the economy is not sustainable with all the money printing that we're doing and the inflation and just the whole system is broken and that very soon there will be a massive crash and the world will move to alternative systems that aren't inherently flawed. Whereas this person is saying that um, that they can kick down the can down the road for a while. Um, now, he, he doesn't deny that nothing has really been fixed since the 2008 financial crisis. Um, if anything, it's gotten worse. But he's saying that uh, the kicking down the, the can down the road is going to continue. The solution to these problems that we're facing will likely be met with more inflation and probably negative interest rates. Um, he goes on in later through this post to talk about how quantitative easing and this money printing is technically a short-term solution and on its head initially to everybody it comes off as as quite good for them if they're not considering the long term so i mean people holding debt that debt is now devalued because of inflation and so it's typically easier to pay it off um People that are invested in alternative assets and are not holding cash, well, those assets are going up in value in comparison to the dollar. Um, it increases economic activity uh, and, and creates more jobs over time. So it, it, it's on its head, it seems great, but there are hidden effects. So one of them is just war forever funded war. Um, it used to be that when countries went to war, uh, eventually a country would, would withdraw when they ran out of money. They would, they would essentially declare defeat and work out the terms uh, of the end of the war. But that's no longer the case when a, a country can just keep printing and printing and funding their war indefinitely through this hidden tax on their citizens. Um, now, it also, it steals from wage slaves, so people that are, are working kind of uh, hourly jobs that don't keep up with inflation, so year over year, even if they're making the same or making small amounts, uh, slight raises every year, if they're not keeping up with inflation, then, then they're always feeling more and more of a pinch. It's harder to get those groceries. It's harder to pay that rent. It's harder to make that car payment every single year. And people don't realize that there's stated inflation and reported inflation, typically around 2%, but then there's actual real inflation because reported inflation doesn't take into account things like fuel and food and rent. Um, it, it just takes into account a few minor things, but the vast majority is ignored. And if you take that into account, then inflation is far more than 2%. And so um, these people that we're referring to as wage slaves, this, I mean, it's anybody that's working hourly and their job is not paying them more than inflation. Uh, so this also, this QE, this short-term fix, uh, it penalizes people that are saving their cash um, because that cash is worth less and less every single year. Um, and just in general, it's, it's unsustainable because we see what happens when you take it to ex its extreme. You get instances like Venezuela where million plus percent inflation and, and the currency is worthless and littering the streets. Um, so I wanted to finish here by, by diving into a couple little quotes near at the 
near the end here. So he says, there's no reason why we couldn't see a gallon of milk going for $50,000 and average salaries in the hundreds of millions or billions. The issue would be if other economies don't inflate at similar rates, they can gain purchasing power over us. So, major economies just need to inflate at roughly similar rates, and they can keep this game going as long as the people let them keep going. And the people will let them keep going, because those who are most negatively affected by these policies literally have no idea these policies are affecting them. Those who are most aware of these policies are in a position to take advantage of them, so they root for it. And that rings pretty true. People that are privy to this, that are at the top, the banks themselves, they don't care that every time they issue a loan, they're they're just magicking it into existence. Um, And when there are bailouts, who gets the bailouts? Well, banks, right? And they use those bailouts rather than loaning to small mom and pop businesses to grow the economy. They take that money and they invest it in the stock market, which gets inflated and pumps their banks. So... It is an inherently broken system. Um, Anyways, to finish off here, uh, the person says, I suppose it's more comforting to be distracted than to see the global system, which has kept the order for nearly 80 years, is being radically renegotiated without input from the people. It would be hard for the masses to keep going through the motions if they knew the magnitude of changes they soon may be facing. Um, So, again, it's, it's... just a a kind of a step back, a sobering look at, hey, uh, we think that the change is going to happen like that and people are just going to migrate over to a new system and it's going to be fine once we're there. But realistically, things are going to have to get really, really bad before people really jump ship. Even again, referencing Venezuela, look how bad it's gotten there. And, And Bitcoin is a part of it and it is helping. But by and large, it's it's not a mainstay of the economy. People haven't completely switched over. Um, they're just using uh, less inflationary assets. There's a lot of U.S. dollar, and um, but the U.S. dollar is is subject to the same types of policies, just less so. It's just taking one flawed system for a slightly less flawed one that hasn't gotten to the extremes yet. So, um, yeah, I do think that this was a really great write-up by this individual. I will link it down below. I will also link to the U.S. National Debt Clock. Lots of fun figures to check out there. Uh, But I'm going to wrap it there, guys. Let me know what you think about this and the other stories I talked about. Of course, always do hit that like and subscribe button and hit the little bell notification button. If you're new to this, I'm always in the chat during the show. I'm always chatting people up and saying, hey, uh, as this airs for the first time. So if you get that notification, you can jump in and we can all talk together. And finally, if you do like what you see here, you're always welcome to leave me a tip at my tippin.me account where you can drop a lightning network tip few sats, whatever you want to do. Um, If you don't know how to use this, I did make an explainer video and I'll link that to the cards and down below if you want to check that out. But that's it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you tomorrow for your daily session.